an estimated 500 million people infected, between 50 and 100 million dead, a world torn apart by war and by a strange, deadly new disease. It swept across the world, leaving nowhere untouched. It was so deadly, rumors spread through the streets that the Black Death had returned. This was the Spanish flu of 1918, the deadliest pandemic of the 20th century. Epidemics have infected societies throughout history. Usually epidemics come and go, but some truly stand out for their viciousness. In recent history, there has been no pandemic more devastating than the flu of 1918, sometimes called the Spanish flu or swine flu. It killed about 675,000 in the United States alone. The outbreak came in the midst of World War I, and the flu would actually kill more troops than combat. The flu of 1918 was so deadly it killed more Americans than World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Yet Spanish flu was horrifying for even more reasons. It was very contagious and it killed extremely quickly, sometimes in as few as 12 hours. It killed people in the prime of their lives, with the most victims being young, healthy people aged 20 to 40. Additionally, it killed some of its victims in bizarre, brutal ways, completely unlike a typical flu virus. Some symptoms actually closely resemble the plagues, which killed millions in the Middle Ages. But scientists have analyzed the pathogen's genome and verified it was not Black Death, which killed millions in 1918. The city of Wuhan, the center of the COVID-19 outbreak. Quarantine zones were set, facilities built in record time, but still it couldn't be contained. First a city, a province, then a country. Next, a cruise ship docked in Japan. As cases multiplied on the Diamond Princess, the world watched in fear. In South Korea, the city of Daegu raised the alarm. Authorities in Asia struggled to stop the spread. Then, Italy, Iran, the world succumbs. With reports of deaths on most continents and no vaccine in sight, the questions remain. How far will the virus spread and how many more lives will it take? Hello, I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Welcome to this special series on the ongoing international COVID-19 crisis. Every week, we'll be bringing you crucial information about the spread and answering your questions about this outbreak. First, let's take a look at the impact so far. There have been more than 3,380 deaths. More than 98,000 cases have been identified in 47 countries. It's important to note that more than 54,000 of those people have already recovered. In Australia, there have been 60 positive tests. Two elderly people have died. This week began with the solemn news that Australia had registered its first coronavirus death. 78-year-old James Kwan died at a hospital in Perth after contracting the virus on the quarantined Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan. He was evacuated to the Howard Springs facility in Darwin with the rest of the Australians who were on board that ship. He was then sent to Perth. Mr Kwan's 79-year-old wife has also tested positive and she remains in a stable condition. As the country reeled from that news, New South Wales officials confirmed that many had, what many had been dreading, the first human-to-human -human transfer of the virus in Australia. A 53-year-old health worker and a 41-year-old woman tested positive even though they had not left the country. An ominous milestone was reached on Tuesday the total number of people killed globally passed 3,000. Share markets, already tumbling because of investors' concerns about the spread, plummeted again. And the Reserve Bank cited COVID-19 as one reason to cut the cash rate to a record low. 
with a growing caseload in Australia, panic buying of non-perishables set in. The aged care sector, already on edge, was given the news it was dreading on Wednesday. Positive cases turned up at a home in Sydney. That same night, a 95-year-old resident was confirmed as Australia's second victim of the virus. On Thursday, South Korean citizens and travellers were being barred from entering Australia. There are now three countries on Australia's travel ban list, with South Korea joining Iran and China. For the Australians who were on board the Diamond Princess, their longer-than-expected holiday came to an end. Finally out of quarantine, they left the Howard Springs facility in Darwin to finally go home. A school in North Sydney has now been closed after a student there tested positive. Epping Boys High is within two kilometres of that aged care facility where the second Australian death happened. The area is now seen as the centre of the outbreak here in Australia. Iran remains a primary concern. It's not only the source of the majority of cases in Australia, it also has the highest death toll outside China and Italy. Many neighbouring countries have condemned the government there for not doing enough to contain the virus. That became evident when more than 23 members of parliament tested positive to coronavirus. Professor Sharam Akbazadeh is an expert on Middle Eastern affairs. He has family in Iran and says they can't quite believe that all this is happening. First of all, the population is in shock. Everyone is in shock. They can't believe how fast this uh, virus is spreading. And there is a certain level of uh, anxiety and angst towards the government for not informing the population about the seriousness of the matter. Uh, there's already been a precarious position, hasn't there, politically and economically for Iranians, given the sanctions that have been biting in Iran? Iran has been never a difficult situation uh, since the United States withdrew from the UN, uh, from the um, nuclear deal uh, and imposed sanctions on Iran. And um, it's very um, unclear as to uh, Iran can have access to uh, medication it needs to deal with the uh, cor coronavirus. Um, even though the sanctions don't um, apply to medication and uh, medical matters, um, Iran is uh, finding it difficult to trade internationally because banks don't want to deal with Iran. So it has been a very difficult situation, yes. How much are people there directing their frustration towards the country's religious leaders and political leaders? Well, the fr there is a complete lack of trust and confidence in the way the government has handled the situation. The Iranian government first denied that there is a problem, then they, they tried to downplay the issue. Uh, the Supreme Leader even said that the Iranians can pray uh, and that Iran has faced so many uh, challenges in the past. This is going to be one another challenge that Iranians can um, can defeat and overcome. So there has basically the Iranian leadership put its um, heads in the sand and didn't didn't show any preparedness to deal with the issue. So the population sees that. So there's a loss of confidence. And this comes on top of earlier incidents. Um, if you recall, the Ukrainian uh, airliner downing was denied, but Iranians were denying that Iran was responsible for it. So there is a lack of confidence in the way and lack of trust in the way that the government is handling um, many of these crises. Why are they so unprepared? I mean, 25 MPs there have contracted this disease now. Uh, religious leaders have been giving all sorts of very dubious advice about how to deal with this outbreak. How is it that they've been caught off guard like this? Well, I think they, they didn't really realise how serious the matter is. But now, only in the last 24 hours, they have moved to um, put quarantine on a northern region of Iran. Uh, that is uh, seems to be uh, uh, infected quite severely. Um, I Iran has now closed schools and universities and uh, Friday sermons are now uh, cancelled. So I the Iranian leadership is trying to play a catch-up game with the uh, coronavirus, but it's very, it's questionable whether it's enough. Professor, in normal circumstances, you would see conditions like these precipitating protests. We've seen that play out in Hong Kong and throughout the Middle East. What are the chances in this case that people would continue to gather in large numbers to protest against what they're seeing as the, uh, an inadequate government response? 
Well, there has been a series of protests in the past in relation to government incompetence, price rises, corruption. But in this specific case, I think the fact that this is we are dealing with a uh, transmittable disease, contagious disease, uh, people are quite hesitant to uh, come to the streets and rally and protest against government. Professor really Sharam al thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, as we've seen, there's a lot of information and misinformation about coronavirus and the sheer amount of it can be daunting. To cut through it all is the ABC's medical expert and host of RN's health report, Dr Norman Swan. We put some of your questions to him earlier. Why is this any worse than last year's particularly virulent flu season? What's the difference? Um, well, probably more people were infected. It's a very good question. What's different from the flu season? There's a couple of things different. One is that the mortality rate, in other words, the chances of dying compared to the total number infected is several times more with coronavirus. So it's about 0.1 with seasonal flu, 0.1% of total number. And it's probably around 1% with coronavirus. So more people get sick and die, um, although it's a different group, slightly different group of people who get sick and die. And there's no vaccine. So there's no, there's, no, there's no treatment and no vaccine. So, so how worried should we be? I mean, there's this sort of question about what information we can trust, what sources of information we can trust, and whether this is either a beat-up or whether we're not being given all the information, all the facts. Well, it's not a beat-up. And the best thing that could happen here is that it's a total fizzer and the doom and gloom predictions don't happen. That's, that's what everybody actually wants to happen. We don't want to ignore it and then we have a nightmare on our hands. So the issue here is, and it's actually one, it's a, it's a statistical question, issue. The individual risk for you and me is really low. Particularly if you're at the younger age of the spectrum. That's right. So there's a straight line almost in terms of severity. And, uh, well, and it certainly jumps after the age of 40, so it's not quite a straight line. So if you're young and fit and healthy, the chances of getting seriously ill and dying are around about 0%. It's very, very low. Whereas if you're 80 years old and you've got heart disease and diabetes or lung disease, your chances of dying could be anything up to 15%. So it does depend on your age and who you are. But also... Even though the number of cases are increasing quite quickly in Australia, it's still very low numbers. So it's a handful of people in a country of 25 odd million people. So the chances of you catching it from somebody else at the moment are really low. The issue is us all pulling together as a community to lower the risk as a community and slow the whole thing down. Because if a million Australians get it, Five to 10,000 people will die. And a lot more than those people will end up in an intensive care unit, taking up ventilators and what have you. Bad for them, but also means that if you've got a heart attack and you need coronary artery bypass surgery, there may not be a bed available for you to be treated. Or if you've got cancer and need cancer surgery, there may not be a bed or an intensive care bed. So we block the system and the system stop, the healthcare system stops working. That's the population one. So the chances of us getting it over time, probably quite high, chances of getting into problems, quite low, but the impact on the whole system is huge. When do you become infectious? When does it become contagious to other people? Is it within days or only when you are showing symptoms? The problem with this virus is that you're infectious before the symptoms come out and you can be infectious even if you never get symptoms but you're infected. So one study a couple of weeks ago showed that, uh, and it's a small study, but they, in one individual they were asymptomatic throughout and they had just as much virus in their body as somebody who was showing symptoms. So asymptomatic people can spread it and you can spread it before you get infected. The incubation period is probably on average around five days, but there's a lot of variation around that. It could be a bit shorter or longer, which is why they play safe. 14 days is, is very safe. There was talk of it being up to 21 days or four weeks as well. Yeah, I, I think those are probably very rare cases if they're indeed right at all. And when you're actually infectious before the virus, it's probably two days or something like that before that. But even then, there's debate about that. Although we, we are learning quite a lot from the Chinese epidemic. Tamara asks the question, Tamara Seftra, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, what about interstate travel, given that New South Wales and Victoria have the largest amount of cases, what's the likelihood of seeing... I wouldn't be worrying about interstate travel in the, in the slightest at the yeah. moment. I mean, these are tiny numbers. There's five million people in New South Wales, but a similar number of people in Victoria, and we've got, you know, 20, 30 cases. By the end of the weekend, there'll be double that at least, but it's still only a handful of people 
in a state of several million people. So you would not, uh, you know, if one of the, our states had several thousand and one had 20, well, you might start to think about it. But at the moment, it's pretty evenly spread throughout the country and it, there's no particular risk with travel. Different question is, should there be a conference of 3,000 people um, mixing, particularly overseas guests coming from there? You know, that's a difficult question to answer at the moment. A number of people, including Kimberley Forrester, asking the question, at what point does the government accept advice to close schools, universities, public transport? Well... Is there a benchmark there? No. Um, you know, it's, it's judgment. So they've closed the schools in Italy for a while. Mm -hmm. And I think Korea has clamped down on it too. Now, that's what you do in a flu pandemic because children are super spreaders. So if children get infection, they are super spreaders. And so, um, and they did it with uh, Zika virus as well. They, 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 they stopped, try to stop children spreading it. It's unclear at the moment the extent to which children are super spreaders of this, even though they don't get many symptoms. So we don't know. So, it's, so when they close schools, they're likening this to an influenza pandemic, epidemic or pandemic. And they actually don't know whether that will be effective. Um, so it could be unnecessarily disruptive because children might not be a problem in this one. And if you want to hear more answers from Dr Norman Swan, you can check out our full 40-minute chat on the ABC News YouTube channel. You can also hear more from him on the ABC podcast. It's called Coronacast. And you can stay, of course, up to date with the latest information on the special coverage page of the ABC News website. That's at abc.net.au slash news slash story streams slash coronavirus. Thanks for joining us. Keep sending us your questions. We'll be back with more next week. For now, though, goodbye.